Hi, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whenever you may be watching this webinar. My name is Hunter Stanfield. I am currently a doctoral candidate in couple and family therapy. Welcome to the North Central Region Aging Network webinar on conflict management, when things get tough, handling difficult situations, people, and ourselves in conflict. As I mentioned, I'm currently a doctoral candidate in couple and family therapy at Kansas State University. I also have completed a master's in psychology, a master's in dispute resolution. Uh, for a short period of time, I was a mediator with the Los Angeles County Superior Court System, a family mediator with the, with the state of Virginia and the domestic relations courts. And I've also been a state approved mediator in the state of Kansas, providing domestic mediation to families going through the legal separation process. I also have a master's in couple and family therapy, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of Kansas. And so really this webinar over the next few minutes is gonna be a culmination of my work with people professionally in terms of how to help them better manage the conflict that comes up in their day-to-day -day lives. So to get us started, I wanna go over some guidelines real quick. This is first going to be an introduction to managing difficult situations, people, and ourselves in conflict. And I say introduction because this is really, I think for anyone and for all of us uh, pertaining to conflict, this is going to be a lifelong journey in terms of how to learn how to manage ourselves in these situations, how to manage difficult situations, how to manage difficult people, um, and also how to manage ourselves. Second, uh, rather than thinking, oh, I really wish this person that I work with or this person, my neighbor or my friend or my family member, insert his or her name, uh, could hear this information and watch this webinar. Uh, please consider about how all of this might apply to you and how you might be in conflict. And lastly, as we're going along, as we're going through these inform this information and the examples and the skills, make a few notes about one thing that you could potentially start stop and continue doing when it comes to better managing difficult situations, people, and yourself in conflict. So why do you, I guess it's always, I like to frame this as why having this conversation about conflict management is important or why have it at all. Uh, this quote is adapted from Dr. David Schnarch. He's a couple uh, psychologist. He's the author of many books, one of which is Passionate Marriage. And I've adapted this quote slightly uh, to maybe more for the workplace setting, but it also applies to other types of relationships. But some may say, you promise to be a team player and pick up the slack when I may not be doing well, to fill in the gaps or when I might not understand what's going on. And yes, from time to time, we all do need to pick up the slack and fill in the gaps for others. But the assumption is that each person will do everything possible to overcome their limitations, to grow and develop their knowledge and skills, not simply demand their coworkers put up with the same issues every single day without doing anything themselves to change or to grow. Now, again, some of you may be thinking, I need this person that I work with to hear this quote, to read this and to let it sink in for them. But for us, I think this is important because I think when it comes to conflict, a common response that I hear is, I hear from people, is that this is just who I am. This is my personality, quote unquote. This is how I do things. And that may have worked for a little while. But the assumption here is that you will, we will all work to overcome our limitations, to grow and develop knowledge and skills. And specifically when it relates to conflict management and how that may emerge in the workplace and may emerge in our uh, personal relationships and other facets of our life. I think it's important to realize that not, it's important to not just settle in terms of the skills and the knowledge that we have, but to continue growing and changing every single day. So as we dive into this conversation, again, just begin to think about for yourself, what might be some sticking points or what might be some difficult things for you when it comes to managing conflict? Uh, in your day-to-day -day life. So to start, I would like for each of you that are watching to, as our friend here is doing on the screen, to fold your arms in front of you. Just put, just fold your arms in front of your chest. And once you've done that, I would like for you to now put the other arm on top.
Now, after you've taken a few seconds and you've been looking down at your arms to make sure that that kind of works or does that even fit, you can put your arms down now by your side or whatever you were doing before I asked you to engage in this exercise. But the whole reason I asked you to do that is because when I asked you the first time to fold your arms in front of your chest, I highly, I highly, I, I, I'm assuming here, presuming that many of you didn't even think I, this is what I need to do. This is how I fold my arms in front of my chest. However, when I asked you to put the other arm on top, because it probably was not like how you typically do it, it was a little bit awkward, it was uncomfortable, and it wasn't the norm. And that's how I think most of us are in conflict. We have our default ways of doing it, quote, just putting our arms in front of our chest the natural way, what's the norm for us. And then what I'm going to be asking you to consider or is maybe that awkward, strange, unsure, uh, this uncomfortable thing about maybe considering that there's different ways, maybe a better way of handling some of these things when it comes to conflict. And we all have our defaults. We all have the things that we just naturally fall to. But I want to ask you over the next couple of minutes to consider about these other techniques, these other ways of thinking that may be uh, able to better help you when you are facing challenges in terms of conflict. So before we dive into skills and all that kind of jazz, we need to define conflict. So what is it? And there are two parts to a conflict. The first is when you think another person or persons are going to cause you problems for you and your goals, desires, or needs. And basically this is when you begin to think that someone else is going to interfere with what you most want. That's the first part of the conflict recipe. The second is when others rely on you and you rely on others or there is an interdependence as a result of roles or responsibilities. An example I always give here is if you've ever been to a movie theater, uh, it's this big room that well, years ago we used to pay a lot of money to go watch a movie and now we just pay $10 a month to watch Netflix or Hulu or whatever it is on our couch from home and unlimited movies. But if you've ever been to a movie theater and you've been maybe with your friends or family and you've been the first ones to walk into the movie theater, what do you do? And I think most of us would say, I'm going to pick, we're going to pick the best seat in here. We're going to walk about halfway up and we're going to go right smack dab in the middle and you've got the best seat in the house. And so you're sitting there with your friends or your family, eating your popcorn, kind of chatting before the movie gets started. And about two or three minutes later, uh, you hear this noise coming down the hallway and then you see this other family turn the corner and they begin to look for their seat. And what do you begin to think? you begin to think they better not sit in front of me. And that thought is the first part of a conflict. And what you want in terms of your role at this point in time is for them not to sit in front of you because you want to be able to kick up your feet and you don't want them to sit behind you because you don't want anyone to be kicking your seat or distracting you during the movie. Now, that's one way of thinking about conflict in terms of this has got to be a win or lose type situation. However, another way of thinking about this, this, this specific example is, what if that other family that walked in comes and sits down behind you? And instead of mumbling and grumbling under your breath, you turn around and before the movie starts, you say, hey, um, are y'all excited to see the movie? And they say, yeah, and you strike up a conversation. And then let's say after a few minutes, you realize you're from the same hometown, you maybe went to the same high school, just separate, just a few years apart. Maybe they own a local business that could partner with yours. And out of that brief conversation comes out a new business venture, a new business opportunity. So either way, conflict just is. How we perceive it, though, is what we tend to say makes it good or bad. And if we think others are going to impede on what we most want, they're going to cause us problems. We're going to say conflict is probably bad. However, if we say conflict just is, and there may, this may be an opportunity, we may see new things that can come up that we might not otherwise have realized before. So next, what is conflict specifically about? There's going to be five things that we say conflict is most generally about if we really boil it down. 
The first is basic needs, food, water, shelter, clothing. Uh, if you've ever been at a large family holiday and there's say 20 people around and there's only so much food, you see people going back for seconds and thirds, maybe before some people finish their first plate or there's that one pie that everybody really wants. And so you see people kind of circling the pie because there's not a lot of it to go around. The second thing is differing values or perceptions. We all have belief systems, decision-making processes, or lenses which we see the world around us and others through. And these color how we see things. And we maybe some of us have similar lenses, but probably more than likely, uh, many of us have different lenses, values, or perceptions that we see the world through. And then we have differing interests. Maybe your favorite color is green. My favorite color is blue. I prefer to get up early and go to bed uh, early. You may prefer to get up late and go to bed late. Um, you may prefer, you may say that early is on time and I may say on time is on time. We have differing interests in terms of preferences, wants and expectations. And then there's limited resources. My guess is if you've ever worked in a professional role, very rarely, if ever, has your supervisor come to you and said, you know what, we have unlimited resources, so just do whatever you want, spend whatever you want. Uh, it's not likely going to be the case. More likely it's going to be here is your budget, and here is the fixed pie of money that you have to spend, and here's what I'm expecting you to accomplish. So how are you going to do that with your limited resources? And then psychological needs. Uh, very rarely have I found or met someone who says, I love being called incompetent and stupid and ignorant uh, in terms of my work. Um, that's very rarely the case. We all want to feel capable, responsible, accepted, a part of the group, important, our work value. We all want to be healthy and loved and cared for. But when any of these things come into play for any one of us, it is likely this, these are kind of the roots of what conflict really is. So now I have to distinguish between disputes and conflicts. Uh, most, thus far in the webinar, I've been mostly saying conflicts, but disputes is another word that we sometimes throw in there, but there's a key difference here. And disputes are the battle. It's what we can see or what's ob obvious. So for example, you and I may be arguing over the details of a project that we're working on, or uh, I may be complaining about someone else's lack of involvement in a project or playing nose goes about certain work that needs to be done or taking on additional responsibilities. Uh, and if you're not familiar with nose goes, it just means the last person to touch their nose whenever something is offered up in terms of needing to be done. Uh, the last person who touches their nose, they're the one that has to then take on that project. So that's the dispute though. The conflict is the war. It's what we can't see. And it's what we, if we go back to that previous slide that we were just on, those five things. So arguing over the details of a project is really about perhaps differing perceptions or interests. Complaining about someone's lack of involvement is really about a difference in values and a psychological need to be responsible and capable. And playing those goes at the core of it is really about a limited number of resources. We may have too many projects and not enough people or too many people and not enough money to go around to spread in terms of what people need to get their job done. So with that, you can have conflicts without disputes for a little while, but you cannot have disputes without a conflict. Meaning that if you are arguing over the details of a project, there's something underneath that that you need to explore that's the conflict. And what we're trying to get at with this webinar and this information and these skills is how do I when I am in conflict, uh, recognize that this, when, excuse me, when I'm in a dispute with someone, how do I recognize more aptly, more quickly, what the conflict actually is that I'm having with this person or in this specific situation? So uh, to kind of also just kind of provide a little bit of a background, we're going to talk about what's called the power, rights, and interest framework. The first part is power. And uh, back, I guess, years, thousands of years ago, maybe even most recently, um, power was about who has the most or the biggest. And so if I had the most ships, the biggest army, the whatever, then I could basically impose my will on anyone to make them do what I want them to do. 
But then somewhere along the way, we decided that power, that type of power just is not right. Uh, that's power misused, that's power abused. And so we came up with this idea that we all have rights. We see this in the Declaration, the Constitution here in the United States. Other countries have this, the Magna Carta. But it basically, if you work in any organization or company, you have policies, you have guidelines, you have procedures, and these are the rights. These are how things uh, preferably would be done or handled or managed in your organization. And this was a way of kind of leveling the playing field, so to say. So instead of someone that was way up here saying to someone down here on the total pole, you must do what I tell you. you no, know, the playing field was kind of leveled and say, now we can have this conversation because of my rights as a member of this organization or of this company. But then we started taking another look at it and there's another layer. And these are called the interests. And interests are why whatever it is I'm saying is important to me. For example, I may say that I am not going to participate in this specific project that my company is doing. But my interest is because the work that I've done thus far has not been recognized and acknowledged and it's just been swept under the rug. So that's where the interest come the where the interest come into play is that they open up a new door in terms of understanding maybe why people do what they do and why what they're doing is important to them. So here's a quick example. This is an orange. And I'm going to talk about uh, a power rights and interest perspective on this orange. And so let's say hypothetically you and I worked in the same company and you wore a big wig at the company I'm at, and I'm at the bottom of the totem pole, so to say. And one afternoon after lunch, uh, we both walk into the little kitchen area and earlier in the day we had heard an, e an email, a company email had gone around saying that there was some fruit that someone had brought in and you and I walk in after lunch because we're interested in a piece of fruit and all that's left is this single orange. So it's kind of this wild, wild west type scene where it's like, wah, 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 you know, and you're standing at one end and I'm standing at the other end. And if we're talking about a power framework, what's going to happen is you're going to look at me and you're going to go, Hunter, you know what? I'm the boss of, of you and a lot of other people. And because of that, because I have a bigger title than you, I'm more important than you, the orange is mine. And I'm just going to have to go, okay, you know what? That's fine. Uh, you take the orange. and I'm going to go back with my tail between my legs but I'm going to be kind of irritated. I'm going to be kind of upset. But another way of looking at this is the rights aspect. And so let's say we replay that same scene. We walk into the kitchen area at work and there's a single orange and you look at me and you go, Hunter, you know, I am more important and I have more power here than you, but because of company policy, it does say that whenever there's a single orange left and there's two people that want the orange, what they but what, what has to be done is a game of paper, rock, scissors, best two out of three. And so I go, okay, you know, at least I have some shot at this point in time. So paper, rock, scissors, best two out of three. And let's say you win. It's like, ah, oh, well, that was fair, so to say. But you still walk away with the orange and I get nothing. An interest framework, though, comes at it from this perspective. Again, we walk into the kitchen. Uh, we see the single orange. And instead of imposing power, Instead of saying, here's company policy and what's fair, we ask each other the question, what do you want the orange for? And so here's what comes up. You want to make orange juice and I want to make an old fashioned. And so in terms of interest, we have what's called a win-win. I can use the peel of the orange to make my old fashioned and you can use the rest of the orange to make some orange juice. And that's what interests are really about. What do you need it for? Why do you want this? What's important to you? And what happens in a lot of the work that we do is that we tend to come at it from a power and then a rights and then an interest, as opposed to starting out with interests. And maybe if we can't meet and see eye to eye there, then we go to rights. And then maybe at some point, someone with more seniority or more authority maybe has to make that call. But that's a much different process, a much different framework than power, rights, and interests. But instead, I encourage you to begin thinking about it in your conflicts. You may have power, you may have certain rights, but what are the interests, what are your interests, and what are the interests of the other people that you're in conflict with? 
So now I want to dive into a little bit more specifically about what conflict is like for you and I. Um, and this first part I want to call is blurred vision. And I'll just be transparent here. Uh, if I didn't have my contacts in right now, I could not see my computers. I would not be able to see my computer screen. Uh, my vision is just horrible. But years ago, I remember uh, actually my third grade teacher sent my mom a note saying, hey, you may want to get Hunter's eyes checked out. He always sits in the back of the room and he's squinting at the board all the time. And so sure enough, my mom took me to the eye doctor. They put me in front of this weird, funky looking machine that you see on the screen in front of you. And what does the eye doctor do? He or she goes, A or B, B or C, one or two. And their whole, what they are trying to do is trying to be able to help us see more clearly. So that, you know, if I'm walking out of there as a kid, maybe I can have some glasses that can help me see the board that my teacher's riding on, or maybe they can help you walk out of the office that day and be able to drive your vehicle. But we all have, in a sense, blurred vision when it comes to conflict. And so here are some things that I hope can be helpful to you to recognize what may be blurring your vision in terms of seeing what is actually going on when you are in conflict with someone. The first part we're going to talk about are some judgments. We tend to over-exaggerate about someone else's contribution to a situation, and we also tend to under-exaggerate about ourselves. For example, we can come up with a lot of different reasons about someone else's role, what they did, how much of a horrible person they are. But then if we, for example, maybe called them out in a meeting, our rationale for that is, well, of course they deserved it. Uh, I don't see why they got so upset. It was just, I was just being honest. I was telling them what everyone was thinking. So in that sense, I'm maybe under exaggerating about my responsibility, my contribution to the conflict. And instead, I prefer to just think about what, every, what someone else is doing and all the things that they're doing that's making this hor go horribly wrong. The second part, kind of this, this next part is really about, um, it's when I start playing psychic. And it's when I start putting pieces of the puzzle together that I don't even really have and try to make sense of something that someone else did that usually makes them look not so great and me look really good. And you see this a lot on TV when, they, when you see pundits or commentators talk about meetings that went on behind closed doors, for example. And they are talking about as if they were actually in the meeting, they can do a play-by-play -play of what went on and why someone did what they did. All they're doing is playing psychic and very rarely are they actually accurate because they tend to miss out or not know a lot of information. But it's really about is a lot safer. I can play a lot of games in my head that make me look really good and someone else really bad. And that's a lot safer for me in terms of managing conflict. They should get me is the idea that everything I do, everything I say, everything I write, everything I type, um, every single emoji I send, everything should make sense to someone else. So everything I do should make sense to someone else. However, if I had a poll up here and I said, I'm going to add three exclamation points at the end of every sentence that I write in an email, does that mean that I'm angry or does that mean I'm excited? And you may come, it, we may be split, but some are going to say, oh, that means he's really pissed off. He's really upset. And some are going to say, oh, he's really excited. But they should get me means you should know exactly what I mean by what I type and when I add three exclamation points. The second is thinking. This first part, person or circumstances. And I always give this example when I talk to groups. Um, and usually I've been asked to talk for maybe two or three hours. And it's, let's say it starts at 12 p.m. in the afternoon, um, right at lunchtime. Um, and let's say I don't walk in the room until about 12.45 p.m. And they've been sitting there, the group's been sitting there for 45 minutes, just waiting anxiously, wondering what's going on. Most people, when I've given this example in workshops and in group settings, would begin to have asked them, what, do you, what would you think about me? And they would say, I would think you're really in, inconsiderate of other people's time, um, that you are arrogant, that you're selfish, and that you don't really care about what you do. And so the list goes on and on and on and on. And I say, okay, that makes, I get that. 
however, let me add a little bit of information. And circumstances is, I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that I'm a couple and family therapist. And let's say before this group presentation, I was on my way and I had a phone call from, emergency phone call from a client that I had to sit and talk to for a good chunk of time and I was not able to send an email to the group organizer or a text message or anything or a phone call to let them know I was running late and that's how I come I was 45 minutes late. And some people would say, oh, okay, I get that, that makes a little more sense, but you should have sent us an email or let us know. And I said, I, I would have liked to, but I just was not able to. So the difference there is what, when someone does something, I can ascribe to them based off why they did what they did based off who they are, the type of person they are. Whereas when I try to explain something that I've done, I will do so by my circumstances, by the context. And what I found is that we are more apt to perfectly explain why we did what we did based off our circumstances and not really so much so willing to listen to what another person circumstances may be and how come he or she did whatever they did. The next part of thinking that blurs our vision is anchoring. And let's say you and I are having a difficult situation about, and we're having a conversation about a, a project that we're working on together. An anchor is when I hold on to one piece of information and neglect the other nine pieces of information that would either help me better understand what's going on or discredit my one piece of information. But regardless, I'm going to hold on to whatever it is that is most important to me, this anchoring. And this usually happens, I found, when people feel like they're being threatened, when their back's against the wall, or they feel like it's us against them, them against me. And they want to hold on to something that is familiar to them, that they know for certain. And so whenever that's the case, they anchor in, they hunker down, and they won't let go. They're very, uh, not very apt to listen. Uh, to hear or to ask questions or anything along those lines. And confirmation is something similar. It's basically like saying, uh, you might as well go to Google and type in, give me articles that agree with what I think, because that's what confirmation does in terms of our thinking and, and how it blurs our vision. I'm only looking for the bits of information that affirm what I believe while discounting or discrediting all the other bits of information that come in along, along the way. Next, we have shortcuts, and shortcuts sometimes are actually very helpful. Um, if you've ever driven a car, for example, and uh, you came to a red sign that said stop, my guess is, hopefully, you didn't pull out a manual and begin looking at it and saying, where does, what, what does this mean, where's that page, and okay, here it is an index, and okay, oh, this sign means stop, and so I have to stop when I come to these. No, you didn't do that or you didn't look it up on your phone, for example. Instead, you learned a long time ago about what that sign means when you come to it in your car. And in that sense, a shortcut is helpful. But in terms of conflict, shortcuts tend to neglect a lot of information and get us to someplace quicker, which usually leaves out a lot of information that would be more helpful to us to make a decision along the way or to better understand someone and what their experience is. Um, so this comes in terms of familiarity. Uh, it's kind of like anchoring where a shortcut is there may be a lot going on and I'm uncertain, I'm unclear, this is too much. And so instead I'm going to go back to what is most familiar to me, what I'm most comfortable with. Stereotypes tend to make one story the whole story and neglect a lot of other stories along the way. And so this comes, I've seen come into play in work groups, work settings, um, and families even where you know oh you have to work with that department oh, that's that that's that's not good because years ago i had an experience with them that was not great and they're just they're just not a great department well that stereotype then becomes because of that one person's experience 5 years ago that that's how that part department still is that's how the department always is or that there's not any other information to be provided. So maybe there was a lot of other contextual information that if that person asked about, they could find out how come that was not a great experience. Maybe the same people don't even work there anymore, but the stereotype of that department still holds true as it gets passed down from person to person. And then I can't give up now is like the idea of a sunk cost. It's I can't turn around and go back and and say, ah, you know what, I really messed up. 
or I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Instead, when we think I can't give up now, we keep going full speed ahead all the while recognizing I was wrong. But if I turn around and give up now, or if I apologize, or if I ask to, for that to be done differently next time or something to that effect, then I'm going to lose face. They're going to lose credibility. When we just keep going and going and going, though, and it takes up a lot of time and resources and energy uh, along the way, and usually it's not a very helpful uh, prospect down the road. So these, you can hopefully, in going through these examples, you can see any one of them may blur our vision whenever we are in conflict. But if you start adding multiple of these, then it really is like trying to walk through um, a maze not being able to see an inch in front of you and so in terms of in terms of conflict we really need to be mindful of the ways that our vision may be blurred because we can miss out on a, something that's really important that another person is saying some really helpful information that could help us move forward or maybe a new opportunity that could be right in front of us now one of my favorite things to talk about is emotions because there tends to be two camps um, some people are saying I love emotions I'm lovey-dovey touchy-feely give me a hug all that kind of stuff and then some people are get me as far away from emotions as possible so I'm hoping over the next couple minutes I can appease both camps and I'm gonna do that by saying that um, emotions at their core are just indicators they are indicators that something is going on so joy for example, is an indication that something's enjoyable. It's a good thing. Anger is just an indication that it's unsettling, upsetting, or I don't like this, this is not right. At their core, emotions are neutral and they're temporary. For example, it's kind of like going to the supermarket when you're at the checkout line, and if you're looking at the little conveyor belt, emotions are like when you're putting things on the conveyor belt, before they're put on there, there's no loaf of bread and then you put a loaf of bread and then emotions are neutral. It's just, just there and it's temporary. It's going to go off, but we tend to do things that keep us stuck in our emotions in terms of conflict. And so what I want to talk about is really, there's three ways of understanding this. Um, the first part is that emotions at their core are physiological reactions. Uh, it's our body's way of saying that something is going on. And so whenever someone is irritated or frustrated, they tend to feel it in their body in certain ways. Some people may say they start to feel flush. Some people may say they start to get tunnel vision. Some people may recognize that their fingers are tapping. That's the, and that's the first sign that our body is giving us that something's going on. The next is what we call a cognitive, cognitive experience or a thought or a feeling. And that's the idea that uh, I don't like how this is going in this meeting. It's not right that they are talking to this person that way or that they are talking to me this way. And then comes the behavior or the action or what I like to call our choice. So let me give an example of all this. Um, the picture you see on the screen is that of a car dashboard. And what tends to happen when one of those lights comes on, let's say it's this, you know, check engine light, right here, this warning light or whatever, we tend to ignore it and keep driving. And then eventually, eventually we keep ignoring it, keep ignoring it, keep ignoring it, and then it goes away. And we think, ah, oh, the car fairy has come and magically fixed my car engine or whatever the case is. And what's really happened is that bulb right there for the check engine light or the warning sign has burned out. And so you still have a problem with your engine, you still have a problem with your car, but the indicator that's all along been telling you that something's going on is no longer working. And then we tend to be driving down the road somewhere, usually very important, we need to get there on time, and our car starts to uh, break down, we pull over to the side of the road, smoke starts coming up underneath the, from underneath the hood, we have to call the tow truck people, and they come out and the person comes and they're, they're asking us what's been going on. And we say, oh, just smoke just started coming up from underneath the hood out of nowhere. And they go, okay, well, was your check engine light on? And then we have to say, well, yeah, it came on. Like, how long has it been on? And we say, oh, a day when really it's been like six months. And they say, well, okay, well, just FYI, if you had um, 
taken this into AutoZone or the dealership and gotten this checked out when the check engine light came on, it would have been about a $5 fix. But because it was ignored for so long, uh, now it's going to cost you about three to $5,000 to replace your engine. And that's what we do with emotions in conflict. So for those that say emotions don't matter, emotions are indicators that something's going on that are really important to how we recognize for ourselves and for other people what's important to them or why they may be doing what they're doing. And for those that say they love emotions, living in emotions doesn't move us forward in terms of conflict. So here's another example. For years now, for several years, I've worked at a camp in the mountains of North Carolina, and one of the things that I've taught there are, are outdoor survival skills. And one of the things that I teach the campers is that to make a fire, you have to have just enough tinder and, kin and kindlin to make the fire actually go. But if you don't have enough, you're not gonna have a good fire. If you have too much, it's not really gonna be a fire that you're gonna be able to sit around and enjoy. It's gonna be, you have to stand way far back because it's too hot. And so think about emotions in terms of conflict of what is it that you actually need to have in front of you to be able to sit around and have a conversation. It's not nothing, no emotions, and it's not all emotions, and that there's a happy medium. Now, when it comes to whether emotions are good or bad, we tend to ascribe good or bad to emotions based off of our perception of how things have gone in the past. But what we're really doing is saying, um, for example, someone comes to me and says, my partner or my, my supervisors told me I need to stop being angry. And the reality is they need to stop the action or the choice of being angry. And instead, they need to do something different. But anger is actually a helpful emotion. I would not take anger away from anybody because anger is, an, again, an indication that I don't like this. It's a check, a reality check for people. Uh, there's got to be a different way. There's got to be something better to do than what's going on right now. So it's not a matter of don't be angry. It's a matter of can you recognize anger and can you begin to behave differently in terms of the anger? So this quote from Viktor Frankl is one that I love, and it kind of gets, gets at this point of choice. And it's between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and freedom. When it comes to conflict, it's important to recognize that you have a choice. We each have a choice. And what we decide to do with that choice can actually, going back to one of that earlier quote that I talked about, growth and development in terms of how we manage conflict, what we choose can actually help and aid that growth or it can impede that growth. So here are some things that I guess would say are not helpful responses to conflict. These are our reactions or our want to. Something happens and this is like that knee-jerk reaction thing. It tends to fall into two camps. One is called the fight. Um, or aggression, the other is called flight or avoidance. And maybe take a look at this for yourself and see if any of these resonate. If you are an aggression person, um, and again, it may depend upon the context and who you're with and things of that nature, but do you tend to shout, talk over, nag, interrupt? Do you try to get even or do you issue ultimatums? Do you say it's either my way or the highway? Or maybe you fall more into the avoidance team. Do you say, uh, I'm just going to, uh, I don't really care about this, but then you'll go around the corner and you'll complain behind someone's back. Will you withdraw? Will you get depressed or get sick? I can't tell you how many people have come to see me because they've said that they've been sick because of conflict that they've experienced at work when really they are just uh, sick and tired of the conflict itself. But the, the, the effects of conflict do affect our physical and mental health as well. Or maybe this is one of my least favorite, when people act super polite. Um, to me, that's a form of avoidance. Uh, or you could busy yourself. For example, you could say, you know what, I really know I need to have that conversation with so-and-so, but I haven't cleaned out my office in 10 years, and you know, now just seems like a better time than never, so I'm just going to start uh, digging through these filing cabinets and seeing what I can find. Maybe you tell yourself it doesn't matter, or maybe you can be like any one of us, and we tend to take out conflict that we have with others on people that we most love and most care about. And that tends to be, um, if it's work conflicts, it tends to be our family gets it. Or if it's family conflicts, our work colleagues tend to get it. But there's a different way. And we call this the third way. And it's assertiveness. And I, I was teaching a core conflict resolution class 
uh, at K-State and one of my students, Madeline Donaldson, I have to give her credit because this was just a beautiful summary of what assertiveness is. She said that assertiveness is doing what's most important to you for your well-being. Um, and that at its core is really what assertiveness is in terms of conflict. It's beginning to do active listening. It's beginning to use I messages, create a we culture, um, brainstorm, um, agree to disagree. But I will say agree to disagree, meaning after you've gone through a process of trying to learn and understand and come to agreement, but maybe not doing so. But you can still work with that person. Maybe you begin to look for all gain solutions or you expand the pie, so to say. Um, maybe you begin to identify another person's what's going on for them. Um, I have to say, though, for the I messages thing, just to clarify, I was working with a couple several years ago and uh, we were working on our I messages in terms of their conflict resolution skills. And one partner said, I think I've got it. I think I've got this I message thing. And I said, OK, well, let's hear it. And they turned to their partner and said, I think you're an a-hole. And I said, well, that is an I message, but not really what we're going for. So an I message is more about taking responsibility for our own stuff or asserting what is most important for us. And so next, we're going to go through a few different ways that can help us with that. But before we jump into that, maybe you can pause the webinar here and take down some of these questions. Um, but these kind of get at what our reactions may be in conflict or maybe some of the ways that we are assertive. So when things get difficult at work or insert any other location or setting or domain, I tend to do what? I tend to say what? When With certain colleagues, I tend to fill in the blank. When I begin to notice a difficult situation between colleagues, do I withdraw? Do I insert myself? Do I, whatever you may do. Um, when a colleague approaches me about a difficult situation, when I get potentially invited in or I'm a part of it, what do I tend to do? Uh, and maybe this, these last two are something you can ask others about. Of others know that I'm ticked off when and then fill in the blank and then others know when something is too much for me when I and fill in the blank. So maybe that's some questions you can come back to later. So some of the things that I found to be helpful in terms of beginning to uh, flesh out how I work with people and how they work with me, one is kind of a preventative and proactive approach. And we call this the team user manual. Um, I've done these workshops now for a lot of different groups over the past few years. And of everything that all the information has present, been presented, this seems to be the one that resonates most with people and is the most helpful. So take that for what it is. But it's a way of getting to know who I'm working with and for them to know me so that we can work better together. And it consists of the following. And it's me going through and filling out this information for me about my style of work, what I value, what I don't have patience for, how to best communicate with me, how to best help me, what people misunderstand about me. And then I ask a few others, you know, what is your experience of me when we work together so that other people can have that. Uh, and then I meet with my team and we go through each of ours, we share each of ours with, with each other, we compile it at the end, and then everybody has that information. And what one person told me, he was a salesperson, had been doing sales for about 20, 25 years, he said, this team user manual idea summarizes in an hour what I've had to learn in 25 years about some of my customers. He said, "What in terms of what they value, I've just kind of had to learn on the fly, whereas if I had asked them that up front, I think I would have a much better working relationship with them. Um, maybe some of them would have stuck around a little bit longer than they did. Uh, but all this information is about being, getting this information is about being able to use it so that we can better work with others. Because I had an old uh, MFT professor tell me, uh, once you know, you can't unknow. Once I know what you don't have patience for, then I know not to do that. Now it's up to me whether or not I decide to use that information or not, but I can't blame uh, ignorance at that point in time. But once I know how to best communicate with you, I can do that. What, how to best help you, I can do that, and you can do that for me. So just some things maybe chew on and potentially do with your work team. This is a tool uh, that may be helpful in terms of being uh, the assertiveness part. It's called DESK. Um, I believe there's a form of this out there called DISC. 
but this is a little bit different. It's a little bit di different variation of it. Um, and it's going to be an acronym. So D stands for describe the situation. So we're going to go through an example with this. Hunter, when you and I are working at the details for X, Y, and Z, let's just say a project, explain what you see or perceive without judgment. It is sometimes the case that how those details are communicated isn't helpful for me to fully understand what's going on and the necessary next steps. State your preferences and any potential effects. In the future, it would be helpful to me if we're able to touch base in person first and then follow up with an email. If, however, you continue to go to my supervisor with the information first, it's going to take longer for the information to trickle down to me then longer for you to get what you need and longer for the project to be completed. Now, here's where the K part stuff comes in. It's really important. No, you may not get what you want. And this is sometimes very difficult for us to stomach when it turns to managing conflict of, um, we may do all of this really well. You may do the DES part really well. And the other person can say, you know what, Hunter, thanks for the information. Um, I can do that in the future. Or they can say, screw you, this is all your fault, and I can't wait to see you get fired. But that's their choice, that's their prerogative. And so I wanna put this note out there that you can do all of your part in managing conflict well. You can say the right questions, do the right things, use desk the right way, you can be assertive, and conflict may fail. The situation may not get resolved, but at the end of the day, it's about are we doing our part when it comes to managing ourselves in conflict? That's the starting point. Then going back to that choice component, that choice quote from Dr. Viktor Frankl, another person, the other person that we're across from, he or she has the choice to decide what they are going to do. And in that choice, they can create more freedom and opportunity for themselves, or they can create more restrictions and more barriers for themselves to getting whatever it is done. But that's their choice. Our choice though, we need to focus on doing our part in terms of being, doing the assertiveness and in terms of desk, describing the situation, explaining what we perceive without judgment, state what we want with any potential effects, and then just recognize we may not get what we want. Here are some things to potentially uh, avoid and what to maybe try instead that may be helpful. The first part is, First one is beginning with, we need to talk. Uh, I always, not always, I, I regularly got this uh, when I was a student from professors. I got this from supervisors and managers and colleagues, and it always terrified me because there was no other fill in the blank. It was just, we need to talk. Um, and I worried and I got anxious and I was like, I'm gonna get fired. They're gonna tell me I'm a horrible person. I did something wrong. And sometimes I did do something wrong. Sometimes it was actually a good thing that we were talking about, but that didn't lead me going into the conversation the most well prepared. And so now uh, maybe trying, can I talk with you later about X, Y, and Z? Meaning that I need to have a conversation with you and here are some specifics so that you can maybe prepare for us having that conversation. That can be more helpful for those that we work with, those that we are in relationship with. Uh, what to avoid, making decisions for others, telling people what to do. Very rarely have I found uh, most adults that I've worked with, uh, they tell me they don't need another parent, so to say, in terms of their manager and supervisor or their partner or anything. So whenever they are told what to do, very rarely do they actually go and do that. Instead, maybe asking a question, uh, putting the onus back on them, giving them some autonomy than this in terms of what other options or approaches have you considered? Uh, what ways do you think you may need to go about handling this? And then the last one is using the word but. Try to avoid using the word but. So I thought what you said was helpful, but, and research actually shows that whenever we insert the but into that sentence, uh, people actually forget all the good things that were said at the beginning. So maybe try and instead. Uh, I thought what you have said was helpful and, uh, there are a few other things that I would like to talk to you about that maybe could be more helpful in terms of what you did in the future. Um, and invites them into a conversation. It appreciates the work that they've done. And they're more open to be, they're more apt to be open to engaging you in that conversation. Now here are a few, few uh, four-letter words that I've found um, that escalate conflict. 
The first is need. Uh, I don't know about you, but whenever someone says, I need this done now, uh, it makes me not want to do that now. Um, and so try something and try what do you think about this or how does this sound instead? Or this last one is my favorite um, because it kind of is like I'm inviting them into a scheme that we're trying to get away with something. But do you think we could get away with that? It invites them into the process that I need their help, I need their assistance in. The next is can't. Uh, when you say can't, you more than probably can. Or if you really aren't able to do something, instead of saying, I can't do that, try, I'm not able to do that. And here's instead what I could say yes to. Uh, this just invites them into, here's, I, I can't do what you're specifically asking me for any number of reasons, but based off what you're describing, here's what maybe I could do, and then leave that up to them, whether or not they say, okay, that we can do that, or maybe I need to ask someone else. Easy. Um, I don't know about you, but when I, uh, people tell me my job is easy, um, it does not really resonate with me. Like people tell me, oh, you just sit in a room and you listen to people talk about their problems and you go, hmm, how does that make you feel? Uh, tell me more. That's got to be difficult. Uh, but rarely do we use it to describe, we, we might ascribe easy to other people's jobs and responsibilities. Like it's easy, why can't you just get it done? But rarely do we use it to describe our own job responsibilities. Like it's just not that easy, you don't understand. So whenever I, I approach someone, I make sure not just to sound flippant and say, it's your job, it's easy, it's what you do. Uh, because that doesn't invite them into the conversation. Um, maybe their job really isn't that easy. Maybe there are a lot of different facets that I don't understand. Um, and so I need to be mindful of that whenever I'm engaging them. And lastly, ASAP. Um, these are the emails that come in with the red exclamation points uh, and all, and it says, you know, everything has to be done now. Well, and everything, uh, everyone wants everything when I found done as soon as possible. But when everything is ASAP, nothing is ASAP. And what ASAP tends to do for those on the receiving end is it creates a lot of artificial stress, more conflict, more tension. And when people receive ASAP enough, they just stop doing and they stop responding. And so ASAP maybe needs to be couched in more of, um, here's a deadline, to, can you get back to me and let me know if this works for you? Or I dropped the ball accepting responsibility and this does need to be done sooner rather than later. So uh, if you can help out, that would be great. And here's what I'm willing to help out with from my end, just giving a little bit more information as opposed to just ASAP. So in closing, here are a few final notes I want to end with. Um, these were questions that were posed to me in my training uh, as a mediator and as a therapist, but what does someone do that makes them a difficult person to you? So what are someone's actions and behaviors? It's really important to know this because um, we need to know what those buttons of ours that are pushed are. Uh, we need to know what someone may do that makes them a difficult person to us. We also need to know who is a difficult person to you. Uh, who are they, who's that person in relationship to you at work, maybe in your family? How are you a difficult person to others, though, is the key one. And how might you go about finding this out? And then what is the one thing you could maybe start, stop, and continue doing when it comes to better managing difficult situations, people, and yourself? So that's it for this webinar. Uh, for more information about conflict management, you can contact me. There's my email address. And then finally, um, there is a, an evaluation for this webinar. Any helpful and from any, inf all, I always say all information is helpful. So whether that's helpful, positive feedback, or maybe some critical feedback about do things differently in the future, please uh, feel free to share that. Um, hope you have a great day. And I hope this webinar provided a little bit about additional information and skills for you in terms of managing conflict as it emerges for you in your day-to-day -day life. Take care.